All right. Well, good evening, and I uh, hope everyone has, has had a blessed week. We want to welcome you back to Bible 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, the doctrine of the Book of God, provided to you uh, by New Covenant College and here the Institute out of the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. We began last week with uh, Bibliology and Bible Overview, and we went over our course syllabus and uh, the chief textbooks, and uh, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, the layout of the course, how we're going to be talking about the authorship of the Bible, and then talking a little bit about the reader of the Bible or the readership of the Bible, and then the contents of the Bible. And then we talked a little bit about something called epistemology, which, as you'll remember, is the study of how we come to know things. And we said emphatically that when we are discussing bibliology, we want to make sure that the Bible is our final source for all knowledge and for all authority. We get our doctrine of the Bible from the Bible. And again, there's nothing circular about that um, because the Bible is an infallible source. And so it's not a fallacy, uh, though we're circling back to it, because it's infallible. We're circling back to an infallible source. And we must remember that if we are relying on an outside source to prove the validity of the Scriptures, then we've just made that outside source the final authority and not the Bible. So while physical evidence can be very helpful, uh, manuscripts and artifacts and statements from church history can be extremely helpful. Ultimately, we um, always will fall back on the ultimate authority of the Word of God. So tonight, uh, we want to jump into the authorship of the Bible. Specifically tonight, we want to ask the question, how did we get the Word of God? How did we get the Word of God? And I, when I say that, I'm talking about when it was first given. When it was first given, who wrote the Bible? How was it written? That's uh, the, the questions we're going to be looking at tonight. And in order to do that, we're going to have to, of course, define some terms. Bibliology, maybe more so than some other doctrines, uh, requires that the student understand some basic terms. So uh, there's, there's three main terms that we want to define tonight. And uh, the first term is revelation. Revelation, and uh, when we talk about Revelation, we're not talking necessarily about the apocalyptic book that was written by St. John, though that is Revelation in title and in substance. But when we talk about Revelation, we are talking about uh, God revealing truth to man that could not otherwise be known by man. Now, I just broke a cardinal rule. Please forgive me. They say you're not supposed to use the word in the definition, but I trust that you'll understand it nonetheless. Uh, revelation is when God, I'll put it this way, conveys, unveils, unravels truth to man that could not otherwise be known by man. And when we talk about uh, revelation, there's two kinds of revelation that we want to discuss. Uh, we want to talk about general revelation, and we want to talk about special revelation. Now, when we're talking about general revelation, this is also sometimes called natural revelation, we're talking about things that can be known about God from facts, forces, and laws. We're talking about things that a human being, a sensible human being, can discern about God with his own brain power and his ability to perceive the physical world. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And that is general revelation. Paul, in the epistle to the Romans, he says in Romans chapter number 1 uh, that all of us are without an excuse. None of us can say that there is no God. 
None of us can, can say that the creature should be worshipped rather than the creator because God has given us uh, intellect. God has given us senses. God has given us the ability to uh, think logically and to process information. And he's also given us a conscience. And these are uh, God-given faculties whereby we can perceive general revelation. However, we want to understand that general revelation is insufficient. General revelation is insufficient. See, as a result of the fall of man, natural or general revelation does not and cannot fully and sufficiently convey information about God and spiritual things. We still have the ability to know that there is a God, but we have no idea knowing who He is, just looking at general revelation. We know that there is a judge, uh, but we don't understand all of the righteousness of this judge. So general revelation, all it can do is condemn you. All it can do is condemn you. That settles the age-old question, well, what about uh, the guy in the aboriginal tribe that's never heard the gospel? What, what do we do with that feller? Well, he's without an excuse because he sees general revelation, but that general revelation is insufficient for him to have saving knowledge of God. Therefore, we need to go and preach the gospel to him. And that brings us to special revelation. Special revelation. Now, special revelation is a revelation given directly by God Communi communicating divine truth that man could not otherwise know in general revelation. And uh, special revelation is necessary because of the insufficiency of general revelation. If we are to have a salvific relationship with God, we must know who He is via special revelation. Now, while general revelation is insufficient for saving faith, it is not altogether useless because general revelation forms the background for special revelation. Oftentimes when God communicates in His Word or through prophecy, He uses the natural world and He uses the things that we already know as a pretext from which to speak to us. So uh, there's nothing wrong with general revelation. It just doesn't get the job done. And so if we are to know God savingly, if we are to have a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, God is going to have to communicate directly to us. Because of the fall, because of our sin, we cannot naturally perceive Him on our own. The natural man perceiveth not the things of God. So God has to communicate to us directly. Now there's various kinds of special revelation, and I'll uh, write them here. Uh, the first kind that we have, are Theophanies and Christophanies. Theophanies and, I'll do it this way, and Christophanies. And this is a uh, visible or audible appearance of God in the world. Uh, now, it always has to be through the veil of something. So in the Old Testament, we had the angel of the Lord, which uh, many scholars would say that's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, at other times, we had uh, instances like the burning bush when God spoke to Moses. But this is, a, this is a special revelation. This is God stepping into time and space through some kind of a medium and speaking to man. Okay, then uh, also as uh, part of special revelation, we have miracles. Miracles. Now, we don't often think about miracles as communication, but they are. Uh, the sign gifts, the, the signs and wonders, they were miraculous things that, uh, that where God defied the laws of general revelation... Right? So again, general revelation forms the backdrop for special revelation. So for instance, uh, we know because of general revelation that uh, five loaves of bread and two fishes can only feed so many people. But yet God defies 
that, that general revelation defies those natural laws uh, and he manifests himself through miracles. And then we also just have direct communications. Direct communications. These are just uh, the thus saith the Lord's in the Bible uh, where God would speak through a prophet or some, some medium. Uh, he didn't always necessarily use a, a prophet. Um, we also have some, some instances, though there are few, where God just directly speaks, such as at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my beloved Son, you know, in whom I am well pleased, right? But the, uh, the culmination of special revelation, and this is why we're talking about this as part of our bibliology class, the culmination of special revelation is embodied in the Word of God, which is the only special revelation available to us today. Uh, the Word of God is the only special revelation available to us today. In uh, the book of Hebrews, the writer there begins in chapter number 1 by saying this, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. This is all these different kinds of general or of special revelations, specifically uh, prophetic direct communications. But verse 2 he says, But this God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And we know that Jesus Christ is the Logos, the Logos of God. He's the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the final revelation from God to man, and His revelation is embodied in the written Word of God. Jesus is the living Word. Okay, So, revelation is the, the first term that we want to make sure we understand. Revelation. Then there's two types, general and special. There's a couple others. We have the word inspiration. Inspiration. And what inspiration is, is it is uh, God enabling the ministry of the Holy Spirit, enabling God's prophets to record special revelation. So it's God's prophets by the power of the Holy Spirit recording special revelation. So the Word is special revelation. And through inspiration, it was recorded. And we'll talk more about inspiration in just a minute, but there's a couple more terms we need to define. Uh, next, we want to talk about Scripture. Scripture. Now, um, Scripture, of course, has a secular definition of just any writing, a script. But when we talk about Scripture in the theological sense, we are talking about divine revelation recorded by men under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And uh, all of those parts of that definition are essential. Uh, see, Paul, take him for example, there were many things he wrote in his life that were not Scripture. Uh, it was only Scripture when it was his writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost directly from the Lord Himself. And we want to be very clear that Scripture is the only special revelation available today. Uh, gone are the days of uh, Theophanies and Christophanies because the Lord Jesus has come in the flesh already. We have beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Uh, the miracles have ceased because the purpose of the miracles was never the miracles themselves. The purpose of the miracles was always to testify to the message. And so we have the written Word of God. And of course, we're not saying that God cannot intervene into the world any longer, but we're sticking to that strict theological definition of a miracle, which was a uh, miraculous event, a sign or a wonder that God used to testify His message. The canon is closed, and uh, those prophetic miracles have ceased. There's no need for them any longer. And uh, revelation itself has ceased with the completion of Scripture. 
God is no longer giving divine revelation. Divine revelation ceased when the last uh, jot and tittle of this word was written down. That was God's final word to man. So, you know, some people say, boy, it sure would have been nice to live in the days of the, of the prophets and to live during the ministry of the prophet Isaiah and to be sitting there in Jerusalem and to hear Isaiah's voice say, Thus saith the Lord, and nobody had ever heard this revelation before, and Isaiah preaches it, and we hear it for the first time. Man, that would be something. Well, I'll tell you something that's even better than that. We hold in our hand everything that God would possibly want us to know. That that's, might not be as sensational, but if you're looking for sensation, you're looking for the wrong thing. We have God's complete word in our hand. And what a wonderful, comforting truth that is. So, uh, Scripture is the only divine revelation that we have today. Then we want to talk about illumination. Illumination. And um, those of you who are familiar with vocabulary, you'll probably see from this loom here, loom, that this has something to do with light. And essentially, that's what it is. It is God turning the lights on. The technical definition for illumination is the ministry of the Holy Spirit enabling God's people to receive and understand Scripture. So, it's twofold. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, um, God's people, when they read it, they can recognize it as being Holy Scripture. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. But also, the Holy Spirit enables us to understand Holy Scripture. And we want to be careful here and mention that He does this in an organic way through the elect of God, through the redeemed as a whole. Uh, Every Tom, Dick, and Harry that says that they're filled with the Spirit that comes up with some wacko theory uh, is not necessarily guided by the Lord into that truth. But we understand that over the period of church history, now it's gone on for 2,000 years, and if the Lord tarries, it'll go on for another 2,000 years. The Holy Spirit has borne a consistent testimony. And, and uh, yes, there's always going to be uh, heretics and outliers, but for the most part... Uh, we are able to agree that these 66 books are the Word of God, and we're able to pretty much agree on the overall teaching. Of course, we're always going to have disagreements on some of the semantics, but uh, we're not in the dark as God's people. We're not in the dark as God's people. He's given us His Word, and He's allowed us to be able to understand His Word. So, those are some uh, some theories, uh, or not theories, but some vocabulary that we need to understand. Revelation, inspiration, scripture, and illumination. And you do well to make sure that you can uh, uh, state the, the meaning of these words. Uh, but now I want to talk a little bit about uh, some theories of inspiration. Some theories of inspiration. So this is a very important word, uh, inspiration. And again, inspiration is the ministry of the Holy Spirit enabling God's prophets to record special revelation. But the question is, how did God do that? How did He inspire the Word? Well, there's a one theory uh, called mechanical inspiration. Mechanical. And uh, this theory says that well, the way God inspired the Word was He took His prophet... And he basically uh, just used them like a puppet on a string. And um, he literally just dictated what the prophets were to write. They had no freedom. They had no personality. Uh, they were entirely passive. Their minds contributed nothing to the style and form of Scripture. Okay, That's mechanical inspiration. Well, we reject this view of inspiration. Uh, we see that it's patently false because we can see the different contributions made by the various writers. If you've studied your Bible for uh, any length of time, 
you'll know that the way that the Apostle Paul writes is very different from the way John writes. And the way Isaiah writes is very different from the way Moses writes. Not only the content, but also just their style. Um, so that's, that's not a view of inspiration that we really want to hold to. Now, on the other side of the ditch, in, in the other hole, you have a view called dynamic inspiration. Dynamic inspiration and uh, dynamic inspiration this theory teaches uh, that the writers themselves were inspired in kind of a, a, a hyper encouraged kind of way but their writings were not inspired so God gave the prophets a special understanding of himself and maybe they were they were just super spiritual dudes to put that professionally but their writings themselves were not inspired. They might have had a couple of inspired thoughts. Uh, God might have impressed certain ideas in their mind, but He did not directly inspire the words that they wrote. Well, this too is false, and this too is probably even more dangerous than the mechanical theory, because this is not the thoughts of God, or the ideas of God, or the ponderings of God. This is the Word of God. And so we would reject the theory of dynamic inspiration. Any Christian could write something about God and it could be perfectly true, but that doesn't make it God's word, okay? So what 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 kind of inspiration do we believe in? Well, we believe in organic inspiration. Organic inspiration. What's that? Well, organic inspiration uh, teaches that God inspired the biblical writers in such a way that all of them wrote in their own style, with their own personality, with their own education, their own vocabulary. All of that was preserved in their writings, yet they only wrote that which God wanted them to write. So God, uh, God oversaw and ordained everything that they wrote, yet they also used their own personality and contribution. So they weren't passive in this thing of inspiration. And this, in a sense, is a mystery. We cannot fully comprehend how God is able to do that with the, the writers. We, we don't quite understand, uh, but we must believe it because that's plainly what Scripture teaches. We see that from the style and the form of Scripture, and also we see that from the plain statements in Scripture stating that it is the Word of God. For example, when, um, when one of the New Testament writers, when John or, or Luke, when they were writing their books, their Gospels, uh, those really were their writings. Uh, they were truly theirs. They signed them with their own name. Luke wrote to Theophilus, and it, that really was a letter from Luke to Theophilus. But yet, those were also at the same time the very words of God to His church. So, uh, we, we believe in organic inspiration. We believe that inspiration is plenary. That means the thoughts are inspired, the ideas are inspired, and the themes of Scripture are inspired. But inspiration is also verbal. The very words that the prophets wrote were inspired as well. So we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, organic inspiration. And um, that is something that you'll, if you, uh, when you're reading the textbook, when you're reading uh, Dr. Hills, you will find a lot of information on uh, verbal plenary inspiration. Uh, so now what I want to do is look at inspiration as it is seen in the text. So let's uh, put our money where our mouth is. We've said that this is our final authority. So let's go to the, to the Bible, and we're going to go to two portions of Scripture that... Um, I, I don't believe you could teach bibliology without looking at these portions of Scripture. Open up first to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at verses 15 and 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. And that, and that form, and that from a child, 
Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So again, it's the Scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. It's not general revelation. And then verse 16, such an important verse. Commit this to your memory. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is uh, such an important verse when we talk about inspiration tonight and then also in the coming weeks when we'll talk about the perfection and sufficiency of Scripture. But as far as it pertains to inspiration, we find here that Paul says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And here we find... Uh, this word, inspiration, that we've been talking about. And uh, the word that Paul uses here is such a, an important word. It is the word uh, theo noustos. Theo noustos. And you'll see theo right there. Of course, we know that um, is the Greek word there for God. Theo and Nustos. Theo Nustos. Now, um, Larry here is, is, a, is a nurse. And so when he sees that P N E U, the, the pneuma and the spiration, we're thinking about breathing, we're thinking about lungs, we're thinking about air. And so if you thought that perhaps this word meant uh, breathed or breathed out, you were right. God breathed. Paul says all scripture is given by the breath of God. He breathed out scripture. That is what Paul is saying. This is the same word in Genesis 2-7 when the Bible says that God breathed life into Adam. So the word inspiration, of course, it is a perfect translation, but um, we... we we have a hard time really communicating the thrust of this word, Theonustos. God breathed. That's how we got our Bible. Uh, it, it, it came from the very mouth of God. And I believe it is the American Standard Version that renders this verse, every scripture that is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. Well, the problem with that is, uh, how would we know which scriptures are given by inspiration of God? No, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And again, if you look this up, you'll see that word pantas, which is all scripture. It literally says, all scripture God breathed. So he breathed it all. It came by the word of his mouth. Now I want you to turn over to 2 Peter 1. 21. So now we know how, how we got the substance of Scripture, but how is it recorded for us? How is it put into written form? Because obviously uh, it doesn't take much common sense to realize that unless it's really, really cold outside like it's been here in West Tennessee, uh, you can't see breath that well. So how do we see the breath of God? Well, it has to be written down. And that requires human agency. So how uh, was this breath of God recorded for us? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Um, well, let's begin in verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And uh, this, this verse right here has been a verse that has been... Uh, ripped out of its context and given much private interpretation. Peter is not saying here that no one person can interpret the scriptures on their own. Peter's not saying, make sure you check all the commentaries before you interpret the scriptures. No, what he's saying here is that um, no prophecy, when he talks about it being of private interpretation, he's saying that the scriptures were not the interpretations of the prophets themselves. It was not the biblical writers who came up with Scripture on their own. 
That's what Peter is saying here. Uh, see, prophecy of Scripture refers to an unraveling or a revealing of that divine revelation. And so Peter's saying here that, that these prophets did not explain the mysteries of God on their own. Their writings did not come from themselves. And then he goes on uh, in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. The word of God did not come by the will of man. It wasn't the, the writers themselves who decided what would be in Scripture. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So how was the breath of God recorded for us? Well, the Holy Ghost moved holy men of God to record it. And you say, well, God used other things in the Scriptures. He used Balaam's ass to speak. Well, yes, He did, but... Balaam's ass was never entrusted the sacred pen. Those who wrote the Bible were holy men of God. The word here in, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, when it says that they were moved by the Holy Ghost, it's the same word that we find in Acts 27, 15 that describes a ship being carried along by the wind. So it was as if these holy men of God lifted up the sails of their intellect and of their hearts and the breath of God moved them along to record holy scripture. So what were the questions that we asked when we began tonight? We said, who wrote the Bible? And we have emphatically answered that with uh, God is the author of the Bible. The scripture is the very breath of God. And how was it recorded? God used holy men. And they spake, or they wrote, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And as we close tonight, I, I'm just going to list these for you. I want to give you um, eight reasons, uh, con some concluding proofs of divine authorship. And these are from one of my favorite writers and theologians, uh, John Gill, from his Body of Doctrinal Divinity. He lists there in his chapter on the Holy Scriptures, he lists eight reasons for uh, proof of divine authorship. Reason number one, the subject matter of the Bible. The, the subject matter of the Bible, what the Bible is about. Uh, this marvelous story of these two people in the Garden of Eden and how uh, they fell into sin and a Savior was promised. And the whole Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation is about one thing. It's about Jesus Christ and His uh, foretelling in the Old Testament and His coming in the New Testament. So John Gill says the subject matter is a proof of divine authorship. Uh, no man could sit down and write a story so consistent about one thing over so many years. Secondly, the style and manner in which the Scriptures are written. The style and manner in which the Scriptures are written. Now, a lot of people um, will, will say of the authorized version of the Bible, well, we prefer uh, a more contemporary version because uh, it's, it's so much easier to read and uh, we want it to sound like uh, like the rest of the books of the day sound. Well, what you may not know is that even the biblical authors, especially in the New Testament, when they were writing in Kine Greek, they used word choices and diction and, and uh, literature that was not even contemporary when they were writing. So the style in the form of Scripture has a, has a distinctness to it. The style and manner in which the scriptures are written, that's number two of a proof of divine authorship. Number three, the penmen and the writers. Uh, the authors themselves, the writers themselves are proof of divine authorship. Many of them were lowly and uneducated and wrote well above their capacity. Many of them lived at different places in completely different times yet they never contradicted each other. 
You've got the Bible written over the span of thousands of years, yet you find no authors contradicting one another, and they didn't have access at all times to what the others were writing. So it was not as if uh, every New Testament writer could just uh, pull up on his iPhone, e-sword, and look at the cross-references of the Old Testament. That just wasn't possible. But yet they were writing and not contradicting what had already been written. Uh, also on the penman and the writers, they didn't conceal their own failings nor the failings of mankind. <laughs> Now, if you know anything about total depravity of man and the, the sinfulness of man and the pride of man, uh, man would not write such a disparaging commentary on humanity. Uh, <laughs> we just wouldn't do that, fellas. I mean, none of us uh, go out fishing all day and come home and say, let me tell you, I caught the smallest, ugliest, nastiest fish I'd ever seen. No, we just don't do that. We make it bigger and better. And so, too, we do that with ourselves. But the Bible is one of the most demeaning and uh, uh, forth-putting books on the true nature of man. Also on the penman and the writers, they were uh, disinterested men. They were not seeking fame. They were not seeking notoriety. Uh, they had, in a sense, no um, naturally explained reason to write the epistles that they wrote had it not been for the fact that they were used by God to do so. So three, the penmen and the writers, fourth proof for divine authorship, the wonderful effects that the scriptures have had on the lives of men. The wonderful effects. Now again, we do not use personal testimony as a proof of divine authorship. Uh, we don't say that, well, the Bible has been such a blessing to so many, therefore it must be the Word of God. No, that's not our final authority, but it is a proof, and it is undeniable that the Scriptures have brought knowledge and comfort and uh, health to so many. Fifthly, the testimony bore to Scriptures by miracles. The testimonies bore to Scripture by miracles. Again, the Word of God in days of old uh, was accompanied by miraculous events. Sixthly, the hatred and opposition of men and the enmity of devils towards the Scriptures. Um, in 2021 in America, all I'd have to do to get violently persecuted is go down to the town square and open up to Leviticus 18 and start reading what the Bible says about men that lie with men. Right. And uh, they hate it. The world hates it, and the devils hate it. And that, again, bears record to the truth of the Scriptures and the divine authorship of the Scriptures. Seventh, the awful judgments of God on those who have despised them. <laughs> the awful judgments of God. We don't have time tonight to think about all the people in, in Scripture who have suffered because they rejected the Word of God and all the people in, uh, in modern history who God has done away with because they were enemies to His church and to His Word. And lastly, the, the eighth and final concluding proof of divine authorship from John Gill, the antiquity of and continuance of these writings. What he means by that is this. Uh, there is not a single uh, portion of literature that is as large as the Bible and as old as the Bible that is still here today. We might have a manuscript, we might have Hammurabi's code, but Hammurabi's code is, is much, much smaller than the Word of God. But we have Old Testament writings that are uh, thousands of years old, and yet they're still here today. No writings so old are still not only here, but so prominent. They're, they're, we, you know, we have Caesar's Gaelic Wars, but Caesar's Gaelic Wars uh, is read a fraction, a small fraction, compared to this book, which is still the best-selling book in, in America today. It's still one of the most read books in America today. Um, so, that concludes our lesson tonight. Uh, we talked about some preliminary 
vocabulary and how we got our Bible, who wrote the Bible, where it came from, how it was recorded, and gave you hopefully some supplementary, remember supplementary, this is our final authority, but some supplementary reasons on why we believe that the Bible is written by God. He is the author of the Word of God, and uh, we trust that you will uh, stick with this class as we will, in the coming weeks, get into the ins and outs of preservation, which that's a sticky subject that we'll probably spend several weeks on, but we are looking forward to it, and we pray that this has been a blessing to you. Uh, God bless you, and at this time, uh, we'll take any questions that we might have. Okay, so I'll repeat the question for those watching online. Um, the question is, uh, do we think that the writers knew that they were writing Scripture when they were writing it? Um, well, yes. I don't know if we know necessarily to what degree. Paul certainly wrote with, an, with a recognition of his authority and as well as the other writers did. And uh, Peter says... Uh, of Paul, that Paul had written some things that were hard to understand, even as the other scriptures. So Peter recognized that, um, that Paul's writings were the word of God, and he connected it with the Old Testament scriptures. See, now all of the New Testament writers received the Old Testament as the word of God, right? But uh, the, the question is, what about the New Testament writers? Because when Paul wrote in that first century, we, they didn't have the time to prove uh, the continuance of it. But very shortly after he had written it, Peter was already calling it Holy Scripture. So I think that the answer to that is yes. Uh, I certainly don't think that they were, um, were passive. I, I guess if we want to put it really loosely, we don't necessarily know the extent of the impact of our ministries. Now, we're not inspired, but you follow my analogy. We don't necessarily know the impact of our ministries, but we do know that the Lord has called us to a particular work, and we know that we're doing this because this is what He wants us to do, and could be that He would propagate our ministry, and uh, there'll be people talking about this class in 100 years from now. You know, who knows? So, uh, any other questions? We don't have any from chat, but I actually have three. Okay. Uh, Um, well, yes. Um, the, the question is, I'll repeat it for the, for the people watching online, taking the class online. The question is, the, the scripture in Second Peter, where Peter says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, is that Peter's assailment on dynamic inspiration? Uh, I, I would say that uh, it definitely rules it out, absolutely. Um, this is really what we would call concurrent divine inspiration. You know, Peter says it's of no private interpretation. So, yes, it, it would rule it out. It would rule out someone being able to say, well, I just, I just felt God wanting me to do this, you know. Uh, so, absolutely, yeah, yeah. The scriptures did not come because Peter one day woke up and said, you know, I think the Lord would have me to write an epistle, and I'm just going to kind of guess and, and see what he wants me to say, right? So... question is, does general revelation call upon men and women who have never heard the gospel to seek the special revelation? Well, uh, general revelation reveals that there is a God, and it reveals that He's a righteous God who does all things well. And so we know that there is a perfect God, and God's also given us a conscience, and we know that we don't do all things well. So it teaches us that we uh, have guilt have, and have fault. And so all of us know that there is um, 
that there is the problem of sin. So general revelation teaches us to seek for the solution to that problem, which is sin. So in a sense, yes, it teaches us to look for some kind of special revelation. But because of the fall, without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we have no way of discerning special revelation. Absolutely, that's how we get the mythologies, because we thought, we, we came up with the idea, well, there's obviously this problem of sin, and so uh, people come up with all kinds of different religious ideas on how that sin problem is dealt with, and unless the Holy Spirit is guiding us into truth, we will inevitably believe one of those. That includes the religion of, uh, of Darwinism, which teaches that sin is a genetic mutation, because we evolved from... Um, single cell organisms uh, through this blind, deaf, and dumb process of natural selection. And uh, so, yes, we do things wrong, but it's, it's because of a, a, of a genetic uh, malfunction. And eventually, through natural selection, our sin will be taken care of that way. We just don't call it sin in that religion. But you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Final question. Okay. Yeah, the, write, the, the question was the writing of the Ten Commandments by the finger of God. Yeah, that would be, I would say that would be special revelation for sure. Uh, but the, he didn't, it wasn't through the, the, the medium of Moses. Moses did not pin it down. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He actually right. put his fingers to stone and wrote it. Right, the, the, the tablets were direct communication. But now in Exodus 20, where Moses copied down what was on the tablet, that would be divine inspiration. And, you know, I guess I, I, guess I should have mentioned this in the class. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, sometimes you'll have people ask about what, what about the, the biblical authors using other sources. So, for instance, Moses r writing Genesis. Moses was not alive for any of that. Um, and people say, well, if Moses used an external source, does that mean that it wasn't divine inspiration? Not at all. There's, there's absolutely no problem with them using external sources and history books. And we see that in the New Testament with the gospel writers. Um, a lot of people believe that Mark's gospel is really things that he learned from interviewing Peter. So there's no problem with that at all. Again, that's why we believe in organic inspiration. So God uses the knowledge of the writer. And um, no doubt Moses was a historian. And no doubt Moses read and studied and th a lot of it was probably passed down orally information about what had taken place there with uh, Abraham and and his sons and Isaac and his sons and so on and so forth but just because uh, Moses may have used that uh, extra knowledge to learn the things that he learned because he was organically inspired that's no issue I hope that makes sense to everyone Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, I hope this class is... Yeah, well, okay. One more question. Um, so you said that the, the scripture is all the revelation that we need today. Mm -hmm. What would you say about instances <coughs> where people didn't, like, tribes that didn't know anything about God, but something happened. For instance, there was a tribe who had um, a prophecy that one day someone would come and tell them how to get to God. And then later a missionary came and shared the gospel with them. What would you say to instances like that? Uh, I would, the, the question is, what would we say, essentially if I can sum it up and correct me if I'm wrong, what would we, we said in the class that the scriptures are the only um, divine revelation that we have today. So what would we say essentially about someone who reports of receiving divine revelation apart from the scriptures? Yeah, and it, it comes true and it seems to be... Um, well... I mean, I could, I could say I, I have divine revelation that it's going to rain next Tuesday. Um, and if it rains next Tuesday, that doesn't mean I'm a prophet. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of times it's, it's almost pointless to even engage in those, uh, well, what about this prophecy? Well, I'm, you, know, you, you know, because the Bible has to be our, our final authority. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yep. So, uh, I hope that hope that helps. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in uh, to the class tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back next week. Uh, those of you who are auditing this class, I hope you're getting a great uh, deal of information. Uh, go on to uh, the New Covenant College's Facebook and website and make sure that you let the folks know at New Covenant that you're so appreciative that they've offered this class for auditing free of charge through New Covenant or through New Testament Baptist Church. And for those of you who are uh, taking this class through New Covenant for credit, I uh, hope that you are uh, enjoying your studies and looking forward uh, to getting into the textbook and some other things. We look forward to seeing you at our next class. God bless you. Have a great evening.